Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Jewell. I'm with Community Giving, and we want to welcome you to our Community Connections webinar series. Um, this is a second in our series on listening to our communities, and we're really glad to have you with us today. We have a number of people just entering the room, so we're going to give people a few minutes to gather, and we'll get started here in just a, just a minute or two. Okay, well, it's about two o'clock and uh, good afternoon again. My name is Steve Jewell. I'm with Community Giving and I wanna welcome you to the Community Connections webinar series that we started when um, COVID and the stay at home order began. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we started a series called Listening to Our Communities. And really this was in response to the murder of George Floyd. And what it uh, caused all of us to do is to simply step back and, and reflect on um, our own um, issues with, with race and how we get along as communities. And what we've committed to do within our own organization is first and foremost to educate ourselves uh, and to listen, especially um, as a white person. Uh, we feel that's very important to, um, to listen and understand. We have a number of resources we've gathered that have been helpful to many of us um, that are on our um, idea center at community found at communitygiving.org. You can check that out. Um, but we started this series with us again, simply listening uh, to hear from people of color who have had experiences in particular in the communities we serve and for us to just listen and, and learn. And so um, we're really pleased to have you uh, with us and thank you for spending time with this uh, session will be recorded. And so that if you aren't able to uh, stay with us for the whole time, please note that the recording will be available at a later point. So thank you again for joining us. And I want to turn this over to Carl Samp. Carl is the executive director of the Brainerd Lakes Area Community Foundation, and Carl will introduce today's speakers. Carl. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Great to have you with us um, for this important uh, discussion and actually listening session. Uh, with, with discussion to follow in a couple of weeks. So uh, thanks for being here. We want to especially thank our presenters today, uh, Bree, Sarah, and Jim, and I'll be doing introductions of those folks. So Steve kind of gave a background. Today we're going to hear from uh, people from the Greater Brainerd Lakes area and the Wilmer and Sock Center areas. And then next week we'll be hearing from folks from Alexandria and the Greater St. Cloud area. So, um, so to kick us off, I'm gonna introduce our two first speakers, uh, mother and daughter. Um, I'm gonna start with my coworker, Sarah Carlson. Um, Sarah Carlson is a mom to a family formed through transracial adoption. She's experienced racial bias through the eyes of her Haitian children and has seen how her personal priv privilege extends to her children or other people of color when she is present or their ally. Sarah will share this perspective alongside her daughter, Brianna, uh, Sarah is also the executive director of the Wilmer Area Community Foundation and Sock Center Area Community Foundation and my friend. Um, Brianna Carlson Bree is a student at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, where she hopes to return this, where she is returning this fall for her senior year. Uh, she is studying social work and has a passion for social justice and advocating for people of color, especially through her role in, as a student senator and a resident assistant. Brianna joined her favorite family via international adoption from Haiti as a preschooler. Uh, Brianna loves music, vintage television shows, crafts, and has an infectious giggle. Uh, you can always tell when she's around. We've already heard it in the, the pre-sessions. Pre Welcome, Sarah and Bree, and I will introduce Sarah after, or uh, Jim after Sarah and Bree are done. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody. It's really nice to have you all here. And it's especially nice for me to be joined by my daughter, Brianna, um, which we don't normally get a chance to do. So Carl already recapped a little bit about our history. And um, today's session is really gonna be very casual, um, but we're gonna give you an example, a, sort of a window into what it has been like uh, for our family 
uh, since our children from Haiti joined us in 2003. And that is really the point when, I say this all the time, when we became a conspicuous family. Um, we could no longer walk into uh, a store or a restaurant without drawing attention the way uh, we had been able to when it was just my husband and myself and our oldest son, who is our biological son. And um, so people started paying attention to us. And we had, as part of the transracial adoption process, we had prepped for some of that. Um, but I don't think I was really prepared for the first palpable interaction that I had with my children. So this is 2003. My children are three and six years old at this time. So they still fit pretty neatly in a shopping cart. And they had been home maybe a couple of months and we were uh, shopping for groceries at a local store in Wilmer. And I had completed the grocery shopping and was standing in line to check out. And an older white woman was behind me in line. And this had been a particularly kind of stressful shopping experience because my two, she's gonna laugh, my two, young, my two youngest children had just, had just found the joy of, of pudding. And so they had, um, unbeknownst to me, put 17 different kinds of pudding in the cart while I was frantically running around trying to shop for the groceries uh, that were essential in our household. And um, this woman was behind me and as I was starting to realize there were 17 kinds of pudding in my cart and I was gonna need to take care of that. Um, she reaches over to me and says, excuse me, but are those two darkies yours? And I am rarely at a loss for words, but I was at a loss for words for just a moment. I couldn't believe she was actually speaking to me. Um, and I ignored her at first and then she repeated the question. So I knew she was definitely going to pursue this line of conversation. And so at that point, I just said, I'm sorry, excuse me? And she said, those two kids, are they yours? And I said, yes, they are mine. And she said, well, how much did you pay for them? And I looked at her and I said, I didn't pay for my children. They were a gift, but I did pay many people and organizations along the way to make them a permanent part of my family, but I didn't pay for my children. <laughs> because my children were listening and they wanted to know what mom was gonna say about this, um, these weird questions. And there were a number of other questions that were very intrusive, um, overly personal. I can't imagine that anyone would walk up to someone in a grocery store and say these kinds of things. And they continued and you could tell that the gentleman behind me was getting increasingly uncomfortable with the line of questioning. And so, not all of you know me well, but those who do will um, not be surprised that I turn to humor and to try and be a little more direct, but somewhat humorous. And I just looked at her and I said, I'm sorry, what size bra do you wear again? And what, what size jeans are those? Just trying to, and she goes, well, I have never been asked such personal questions. And the gentleman behind her said, you've been asking her personal questions that are none of your business for the last five minutes. And you could tell that there was a little bit of an awakening for her, but at that point she was super embarrassed. And so she decided to move to a different checkout lane. And that was really my first time where I thought, wow, this is gonna get real. Um, and some of the questions and the things that we were going to face, I couldn't have really anticipated, but that was our very first um, interaction. Um, my father-in-law, who was honestly one of the sweetest people ever, uh, took our children for breakfast one morning at a restaurant, and some of his friends were really, you know, like, who are these kids? And um, asking my, my father-in-law some very personal questions, and he also used humor and just said, oh yeah, they look just like their mother and left everybody going, well, like did Elty's <laughs> son marry a black gal or it was, um, so I think I, I share that not only because it's very real, those are the, the real experiences where people sometimes some, they believe they're entitled to an, an answer or a slice of your personal life um, that you are not really entitled, you're not relied to give up, to give them. They don't, 
own that. And she certainly proved she wasn't trustworthy with any part of our story. So um, I just want to give you that as invitation to think about the questions that you're sometimes thinking out loud or that you're thinking in your mind to not speak them um, out loud, but that you can be genuinely and compassionately curious about people's experiences. And that can be a way to build a bridge. So asking, you know, what does that feel like for you when it's in a safe place, one-to-one -one conversation in a trusted relationship? Um, those kinds of genuine pieces of curiosity are, are real ways to build lasting bridges. And so I, I share that with you because I told Brianna, it's kind of a clutch your pearls sort of moment. Like you can't imagine someone would say something like that. Um, there were many experiences in our time uh, early. You know, my children are now uh, 24, 23, and almost 21. Um, but the times when they were still at home with us and we would take them shopping to a store, for example, and let them fan out a little bit, stay in sight and sound of mom and dad, but fan out. And we would notice that staff were tailing them or security guards had started to notice them and were walking behind Brianna or behind uh, Braden, our youngest son. Um, but they weren't paying any mind to me or to my oldest son, Ben. And so when I would go over to them um, and say, hey, did you have any luck finding that the balloons for the water balloon fight tomorrow night? Security and staff would go away not because anything else had changed in the environment except that I had arrived. And so my privilege, <laughs> I'm a white gal, I was okay. And that meant that if they were with me, they were gonna be okay too. And so um, I share that because I think it's important for those of us who are from the white culture to understand there is an umbrella we can share um, with people of color. And that is part of what we need to start doing uh, consistently to make a difference for them. Um, initially, I think initially that's what is necessary, but soon, very soon, they will prove what we all know is that they can handle this on their own. They just need somebody to give them an entrance point um, and to use our privilege to benefit them or to make space for them in a conversation. And so, um, you know, we as a family have experienced lots of things. Um, we have experienced the conversations about you know, sitting at sporting events where people say, oh yeah, well, my kid is the one that's two up from the black kid in the crowd. Or um, my son is a gifted athlete and he was running really well, well and someone made a very, um, racist comment about how his, he wasn't talented because he was just talented. He was talented because he was black and all the way back to slave era, um, they had to be fast. So, you know, people don't realize that I'm the mom and I'm hearing these kinds of things um, in my community and watching my children be treated that way. So, um, you know, when you hear things like that, friends, I'm just asking you to turn around and say, wow, that's, that's wildly inappropriate comment. Because until people have to check what they think and what they then speak, um, they have never been invited to understand their own, their own racial bias um, that is coming out in that. Um, so there's lots of rules at our house about shopping and about driving. Um, driving is probably one of the scariest things. It's always frightening for a parent for their when their kids become a licensed driver and they can drive on their own. It's terrifying if your child is of color and especially if your child is black. Um, we have had conversations with Brianna and with Braden about driving that we have never <clears throat> had to have with our oldest child, about where his hands are if he gets pulled over. Where is his driver's license? Where are the materials? Um, if you have been parenting white children 
how many of you have had to write an, a note and that's notarized at your bank that tells um, the police that this is your child, they have permission to use your car if they are pulled over so that there's not an automatic assumption that the car has been stolen, especially when you have a last name as Scandinavian as Carlson. Um, so these are, you know, the little things that we have definitely had to take more seriously uh, for our kids. And I'm just going to tell you that nothing prepares you as a parent for uh, having the police call you to say they've on the scene with your child because someone has called the police um, on your child for <coughs> sitting in the parking lot. Um, just waiting for a friend, but the retailer believes that they're casing the joint, or um, that someone believes that your child who was at a slumber party with other, with other girls is the one who stole something. Um, these are very real parts of racism that families face, uh, people of color face all the time. Um, and as a family, of transracial adoption than we face. So I wanted to have Brianna tell you in her own words a little bit more about rules with shopping and the ways that she manages herself, the shopping and driving, but also her experiences firsthand. Um, okay, well, for me growing up um, in white culture, I really didn't see uh, the racism that uh, students and people of color who were raised by people of color see. Um, I started seeing it when I was uh, 11 years old and I was on the school bus with my older brother. And the first time I knew that, I knew I was different, but the first time I heard any racist things was when a group of white boys called me the N-word um, with the hard R. And um, at that time, I'll, I've never heard that word before until then, um, cause it's not something I hear on the daily. Um, and then from then on, I started to really realize the how different people see me um, just because of my skin tone and that the first thing they tend to see is not my personality, but the they make judgments just based on my skin tone because that's how they're, a lot of them are how they're taught. And um, the one thing I know when I drive or even when I go to the store at school, um, I don't go to the store by myself. Um, I go to the store with um, either one of my uh, white guy friends or one of my white girlfriends, um, just so I know that like I'm there and like I am safe and nothing will happen to me. When I get in the car, um, before I even start driving or putting my seatbelt on, I take out my driver's license and I find my insurance card and I put it in the cup holder um, next to me. So if I get pulled over, I can just grab it and um, not actually have to physically move my head or anything. Um, and another thing that I've noticed is even at Concordia, three weeks into the school year, um, I had an experience with racism where a group of, uh, I sat down with a group of girls, um, white girls, and I just wanted to sit down and have a meal. Um, and they grabbed their stuff and they moved away from me. And at, um, at first I thought they were just done eating, but then they sat, they moved away from me with other people of color to a table that was predominantly white. Um, so that as I get older, I notice a lot more of the racism that is happening. But the one thing I face the most is not racism, but colorism. Um, with colorism, I, um, it's where, the sh because I am a darker um, black person, I face that a lot. I hear of the whole, I can't just be pretty because I'm pretty, I'm pretty because I'm pretty as a dark skin. Um, I hear that I am too, I sound too white for the black community and I am too black for the white community. Um, when I talk, people feel like they need to air quote talk ghetto to me um, so I can understand them, even though I'm very illiterate and I don't need to, <clears throat> for you to dumb it down for me to understand. Um, so the thing I face the most is colorism and that in itself can not just happen in, um, by white people, but also happens with peels, uh, people of color can be, that's one thing where people of color can be colorist. Um, so the one thing I know that um, I've, I've been trying to do um, is 
understand that although I do face racism, that I don't face it in the same way that like my colleagues at school who were raised by um, PLCs face, um, because I had that umbrella for such a long time that um, I didn't notice that a lot of the things until I started moving away from home and that the things that used to protect me um, because people knew who my parents were, people um, knew who I came from, but then when I went to school and nobody really knows my parents um, and I had to build my own foundation that I got judged real quick um, and I faced a lot of racism and a lot of tokenism of um, especially from the school if there's a problem with racism um, if there's a problem with diversity or whatever, I'm the first person they would go to to try and uh, figure that out and solve that problem for them, which I love to help solve problems. But as a student and also as a Black person, it is um, not my job to educate and it is not my job to solve the problem of racism at an institution, um, especially since my other job, my main job is to study. Um, but it's also, I can't really do much as a person who is not in there um, as the institution. Um, yeah, um, I don't really have um, much to say. Um, I know that I struggle with um, going to, if I go to the store alone, um, like my mom mentioned before, when I was younger, I got followed. To this day, I still get followed. Um, when I go into the store, I do not go in with a big purse. Um, I go in with, I don't go in with a sweatshirt or nothing. I go in with clothes that does not have pockets I can, that look like I can have things in it. Um, I only carry my ID and some cash um, and some, um, and my debit card and I go in there and I won't eat, if I leave the store, I always buy something, even if it's a little snack because I don't want them to seem like I went in there, grabbed something and then left. So I always leave the store with something and I always put it in a bag, even if it's a pack of gum or a chapstick, I put it in a bag and I put the receipt in there just so it looks like I got something because um, I don't want to give them the wrong idea at all. Um, so that's not like obviously the full, my full story, but that's part of some of the situations I have faced of uh, being a, Black person, um, not just in America, but being a Black person who, who was raised in white culture, who is now starting to see the real racism um, that is happening in the world and how I, um, how it has impacted me and has uh, ch not changed me, but um, has made me a better person. No, there are, there are just no words as a parent to prepare you when your child um, comes off the school bus and tells you that people told her or told him that they're the color of dirt. And that means they're not worth anything. Or um, when uh, Philando Castile was shot, you have to sit your child down and talk again about car etiquette, not good driving etiquette, about car etiquette and how to be in the car um, you know, I've told my kids, if you get pulled over, call your dad or I on your cell phone, put us on speakerphone, tell the police officer you are on the phone with your white mom. Because I know how important that umbrella is. I've seen how important that umbrella is, even more as Brianna is teaching me about her experiences on her own. I see the importance of that umbrella that I um, and her dad can provide for her. Um, Nothing prepares you. Probably one of the most heartbreaking moments in my parenting journey. And you know, if you're a parent, you know there's lots of highs and lows. Um, but one of the hardest points was when um, everything was coming to a head, and Ahmed Aubrey had just been killed, and George Floyd, and Brianna came out into this very room that we're talking to you from, just sobbing and went straight into her dad's arms. She is 23 years old and needed to climb into the lap of her dad to say, I am terrified that I'm gonna leave the house one day and I'm never going, going to come home. And friends, every time I hear about something that happens to a person of color that is unjust and 
unequal and unjustifiable. That is not just someone else's baby. That is my baby. That could be my baby. So, um, you know, when, when everything happened in the Metro in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, Brianna and I happened to be in the same place and we had gone to visit her grandparents, my, my parents. And they, lived they live across the street from the staging depot of the Minnesota National Guard in New Ulm. And it, the National Guard had just been mobilized to go to Minneapolis. So all the National Guard troops are arriving. It was a very surreal thing. We were all standing there watching it all. But we had a two hour drive in the car on the way home. And um, I could see how tired she had become so quickly because all of her white friends were reaching out telling, saying, you know, are you okay? And it's so well-meaning, but so draining and exhausting and asking her for advice on what should, they should do. And um, it, was, it was a lot for her. And I didn't want to add to that, but I said to her, Brianna, if there's one thing mom could do right now to, that you think would make a difference, what is that? And she said, mom, you need to be really deliberate about inviting people of color to the tables that you easily get to sit at, where big decisions are made and big conversations are had about our communities and our state and decisions that are going to impact us. You get an invitation and you don't think about it, but you need to take a person of color with you. And you need to sit with them and make sure that they have an, an opening to have that conversation and have their voice legitimately heard. And I just, um, I was sitting, I was good thing I was sitting down because that would have put me in my chair pretty quickly. And that is absolutely something that so many of us listening today can absolutely do. It's a simple thing, but to say, would you like to come with me and sit with them so that people who are, who are our neighbors, in our communities can be participants in the process of making their communities better and more equitable for everybody. So I think that's kind of hits on the high points we wanted to share to start. And we're very excited to listen to Jim and then we'll come back and answer any questions. So thank you, Carl. Well, uh, thank you, Sarah. Very, I gotta gather myself a little bit here. <clears throat> As a parent, um, both of us are sitting here crying um, in our room right now. So um, I have the great privilege now of introducing Jim Russell. I've known Jim for a long, long time. I used to work at Central Lakes College with Jim, and I always admired uh, the life lessons Jim taught his students. Um, I was service learning director at the college, and and. Uh, um, I remember Jim always saying he would take them out to put in box out at uh, Camp Confidence and say, okay, if you don't get your education, this is the kind of work you can expect to be doing. So um, I, I thought, what a great lesson, you know, to tell about the importance of education, but he teaches them a whole lot more. So um, Jim's the current men's basketball coach at CLC, and he's also, also athletic director there. Uh, Jim's been a faculty member for the last 23 years there and he came to the United States from Vietnam at the age of nine as a refugee. Uh, through his work at CLC and other community programs, Jim guides a number of young men of all races towards personal and team success, often dealing with issues around race in their new community. So it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Jim. Um, Jim's uh, been invited to uh, and has been nominated to serve on our board of directors. So uh, we anticipate that happening at our August meeting and we're delighted. And Brianna, that's, uh, you know, certainly one of the lessons we're trying to follow up on is uh, getting more voices from different life experiences on our boards of directors. So uh, Jim, welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, boy, that was quite, quite the story. Um, you know, I, so far, all this has hit the fan, and um, I really have been looking hard at my, where I come from and where have I gone, and um, we have racism, yes, um, but I, I will tell you, I, I don't face it as much as uh, uh, 
and Native Americans and uh, African Americans with such uh, great history with them. Um, but, but but I do I do face racism quite often. Uh, but as if you you know, most of the time when we face those, we kind of depress those, kind of put that away, and kind of keep our heads up and, and keep moving forward as much as we can. So, <clears throat> a little background about myself. Uh, um, my father, who my biological father, passed away before I was even born. So my mother remarried a. a great guy from Iowa. He was a teacher over in Vietnam. And anyways, he brought us over to the United States in 1973. And as you notice, he also changed my name <laughs> to James uh, Lum Russell. He kept my Vietnamese name in the middle. But um, <clears throat> he, he did that because he, he knew that kids would make fun of my name. So uh, he wanted to make sure that I was accepted. Um, Anyways, I am a married a Caucasian uh, woman that is a six foot blonde. <laughs> we have three beautiful kids. All three right now are in college. Um, I am very lucky guy. I, I love the job that, that I am given. Um, I, I get to make the big influences on kids' lives. And I think I can relate to them. That's probably why I like it so much that, um, I can help them in some way or another. Um, and Carl said, I've been here, this will be my 23rd year. Um, I um, get to coach basketball and just to let you know that there isn't a whole lot of Vietnamese basketball coaches, especially in college. As a matter of fact, I think a person of color, this is what I think is very strange. In the state of Minnesota, a person of color that's a college head basketball coach there's only two of us. As a matter of fact, myself and Masabi Rain just hired another person of color, but she, she's also a woman and she played in the WNBA. So um, especially a, a sport world that is probably 80 to 9% now African-American players. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, something to look at. Um, I, I take a lot of pride in what I do. Um, it's because I'm very motivated and I'm motivated because of uh, who I am, but how I got here. And I continue to motivate myself because I, I see the race all the time. Uh, so to give you an example, um, if I go out and coach a game, about 80% of the time, the referees won't come shake my hand. They don't think I'm a coach. Um, I think my assistants are the head coach. So that, that motivates me. Um, my team, we win a lot of games. Uh, I'm coming up on 500 wins. But the reason we win, and I tell my kids this all the time, my players, it, not, it has nothing to do with the X and O's. It has to do with a lot of pride, how they represent themselves. Um, and we try not to put race into that equation. We work really hard. You know, I tell them all the time, don't give anybody excuses. Just work hard. Work really hard. And so they'll love you and they'll know you. Uh, be respectful. Um, we push that a lot. And, uh, and of course, work together. Because as you heard some of the stories, it's tough for kids around here. It's really tough in Brainerd. Uh, these kids come a long ways. And I feel very responsible for them. Um, they come a long ways, they get followed everywhere they go. Uh, they have to have their teammate that's white to go with them, to get into restaurants, or just get, go to places they wanna go. They just wanna be a kid, uh, go shopping without them being looked at. Um, how about getting an apartment? <laughs> uh, we have apartments across the street from college right now and they put a new rule in. You can't, if you're an athlete, which most kids that come here that are athletes are, especially for basketball and football, are African American, uh, people of color, and they won't let them rent to them until they have to have six months in advance rent. Well, who has that? Um, so, you know, just some things there uh, they deal with. Um, myself, I, I got a lot of stories I can tell you all. 
Um, when I first came here in Brainerd, uh, I got a lot of emails, a lot of letters stating that uh, don't bring any kids of color in here. Um, this is a community college, it's for people around the area. Um, that was one. Uh, I went to uh, a bar in town because we just, they represent us for a golf league. And, anyways, I went to a bar in town and, and I don't drink, so I don't usually go to bars. I stay out of it because there's a reason for that. But, anyways, you know, I, I got pinned up against the wall that day and uh, a gentleman told me that uh, I don't belong here and that. <clears throat> um, we don't need anybody like you around here. So that, that's an example. Um, a week ago, I went into a store and I was followed. I mean, I've been here 23 years, on my 23rd year, and followed. And, and I turned around and asked the person that was working, I said, can I help you or what? And she says, I'm just doing my job that I'm, I have to follow you and I have to keep an eye on you. And I said, well, make somebody uncomfortable. That's, I don't know if that's your job. But anyways, those are just some examples. Um, my wife and I both also, you know, we get looked at quite often because we are different. And we take, um, take some pride in that too. But we are different. And they do ask me the same question as they ask, um, where are your kids from? Or where did you get them? <laughs> um, so we get that question as well. Because uh, my oldest one looks like me, and my other two, you know, are in between. So, but um, there's just a lot of stuff that goes on, you know, even on, on our campus. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of questions about why we bring these these students here, student athletes here. You know, I have I have people on our campus that don't believe that either, and then we have a community people who don't believe that either. So. It gets tough. It gets tough. Um, I feel I'm always, and I'm okay with it, uh, because I do it all my life. I'm always in the forefront of trying to make sure everybody's okay, everybody's safe. Um, and then I try to answer his questions as best I can, or share examples as best I can so people understand. And all I'm ever asking people is just give people opportunities. You know, I got an opportunity. I love America, um, and, and I thank my dad every day, and I thank my mom every day. I, I love America. Uh, uh, if I was in Vietnam, I wouldn't be here. Uh, I lost my country. I had no place, and this is a great place. This, uh, yes, we go through. Everybody goes through uh, tough things in life, um, but it, I always tell myself it's just. And I, I tell the recruits this, if you can get through this, you can get through a lot in life. Um, if you can face the race, you, you, you can get through a lot in life. And it's tough. Um, we have to continue to. We have to look at the positive and try to, try to fight through it. But again, like I said, I'm not an African-American with all the history behind us. I'm a Native American. So, um, but I also get upset. Hopefully I'm not going... I get upset too because when they talk basketball and they talk coaches, there's a coaches association, then there's a black coaches association and where I stand. <laughs> so I get upset about that. Um, or um, when they talk about uh, people of color or, you know, uh, the chancellor always talks about there's three really important things, uh, you know, the budget and, and diversity. And then they get it and never, nobody ever does anything diversity because it's hard to do. It's hard to deal with. And, but they always talk about diversity when it comes to African-American or Native American. But I'm neither. So I get caught right in between. Um, but um, other than that, I, like I said, I can share a lot of stories, you know. Um, I've been interviewed on a job that was offered a job to me, but I'm not African-American. Um, uh, but they said they needed a minority and, but, uh, they would consider me as a minority at that time, I guess. Um, it's just, and with all this happening, like I said, I'm looking back and I'm always looking back to see what can be better or what I've learned. And um, um, there's a lot. And right now I didn't realize, I did not realize 
how big an issue because I, I guess I depressed all that and I kind of moved on and how, how much this is really, really hurting our country, but really hurting uh, this area and everywhere. Um, I hope that with all this that we're doing can help people. I think it's great that we're trying to educate people. It's great to, I think people get to hear our stories, get to hear everything there is that's going on. So that helps somebody make an influence that they'll listen to, um, that and that we can change. Um, so, like I said, again, I, I'm, I'm, ha I'm, thank you uh, for having me, and I really appreciate it. Um, I'm hoping I can answer some questions, and hopefully, we can continue to learn and move on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim, and Brianna and Sarah as well. Such interesting stories about how different your lives are from ours. And I think that's, that's part of um, the greatest thing that we learn as we listen is um, about the things that go on in life that we're not even aware of. Uh, so I just have some, a few questions um, that have been uh, shared. Um, first, what, what, um, oh, looks like we're doing a poll first, so let me give you a minute to answer this poll, and uh, then we'll start with the questions that we have from some of our panelists. <laughs> okay, I don't know if that gave you enough time there, but uh, we want to get started and be able to ask some questions here. And this one is, is for all of you, but in particular, I'd love Brianna to start with, what gives you hope for our communities and our nation? Um, I think the biggest thing is with, uh, I would say the children um, is one that really gives me hope, especially the new generation that's coming in. Um, Cause as you watch them, they don't have the hate and racism in their hearts. They love all and watching how some of them um, their curiosity um, of why I am the way I am, but they, they're so intrigued and want to learn more. And also the fact that so many um, people in a lot of my friends or even people I haven't talked to in a while um, and how they have responded to everything going on and their response. Uh, I think another, other, my faith is also one thing that really gives me hope because um, I know that no matter what happens, um, I am never really alone. And uh, another thing is like my family um, and that I have extended family and my family is very much a mutt of a family. We have, um, we have uh, African-American, we have mixed, we have Asian and we um, have uh, um, people of di um, divorced families. Um, and so, I think just seeing the fact that so many people actually want to learn and they're not just like, okay, well, this happens, so that's too bad, get over it. But they're like, how can we help you and how can we make this not happen again? So that really gives me hope because it's not like the whole, well, just get over it. And I've heard that too, but like uh, the people in my life that are close to me are not ignoring the situation, but wanting to make it better. So then that, um, people now and people in the future won't have to deal with this again in the future and that we're not going through the same thing. Thank you. I think like Brianna, it, it is the signs uh, that are happening today, conversations like this um, that give me hope that people really are looking with new and fresh eyes at things and they're not just trying to explain it away they are trying to actually understand it. Um, that is encouraging to me for sure. And many times, um, you know, we're a pretty public family in what I do for a living and my husband is a pastor. And so many times uh, people will come up to Brianna and, and just be, or our younger son say, that's your mom? And Brianna says, 
yes, she's vanilla and I'm dark chocolate. And it just kind of helps people normalize that there's something different, handles it with a little bit of humor. And the kids just look at her like, oh, well, that explains it. And away they go. Um, so I think like her, the little people in the world, I have a lot of faith that Brianna's generation and the generation coming behind are going to help us make the change that we've been needing to make as a country for a really long time. Thank you. Jim, what would you add? Well, I, I think the, our whole life is about hope, isn't it? Hope and faith. Um, I think just looking back at my life and, and the opportunity I've had and the opportunities I've seen our, our students continue to grow and continue to de develop, I think there's always hope. Uh, kids are so innocent. Uh, I think if we just give them opportunities and give them chances, and teach them, don't be afraid to teach them uh, and, uh, and care and love for each other. I, I, this, I, I believe that's what this country is about. And, uh, and we see that. And uh, so I strongly believe that hope is, is yeah, it's, it's there. Uh, and, uh, and, and I have a lot of hope that it will work through. We will work through this. So that's, that's what I see. Great. We have a question specifically for you, Jim. Um, what, what suggestions do you have for community members to support the athletes at CLC who feel discriminated against? You know, uh, you know, my life is about giving kids opportunity and give these kids opportunity. Uh, when you find them, when you see them, talk to them. Don't be, you know, uh, I think a lot of us just prejudge and we, uh, we judge wrongly or we get wrong social media, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I dare people to reach out and visit with them. And you'd be amazed. They want the same thing. They, they want an opportunity to know you. They want an opportunity for you to know them. And um, we all feel good because I teach these kids. We all feel good when we help each other out. And so all I'm asking is just give them an opportunity. Just give them an opportunity to say hi, give them an opportunity to, you know, uh, I, I, you'd be amazed because we do a lot of community service work and a lot of these kids do a lot of work out here, uh, helping lawn work, raking, mowing lawns. The kids never leave that yard. By the time they get to know the kid and the owners, they end up having dinner there. They end up inviting them back. It's just, that's, that's part of but I hope that you're asking about it. And just give kids opportunity. So I would love to see these apartments. I know it's a business, you know, and a lot of rentals. It's, it's tough for these kids, but uh, to get into it. And again, to, for them to force them to have six months rent <laughs> ahead of time. Who has that? Who, who has that? Uh, we are very fortunate right now. We have a dorm situation that kids can get into. So that, that has helped out a lot. Um, but again, I, I, I recommend that uh, more community people come on our campus. We have a beautiful campus to come visit uh, the events, the games, or just come talk to kids. I'll set it up because <laughs> uh, that, that's what it's about. So thank you. Thanks. So Brianna, you had mentioned um, before that sometimes you get um, asked to do things and it's, it's more about tokenism. So what can we do as white people to connect with people of color that, that doesn't feel unnatural? Um, oh, I would say um, you can still ask them for help, but not expecting them to be the one to do all the work. Um, like for me at school, although I really love helping and getting the voices of POCs is what needs to happen in order for change, um, for them to know what they need to change. But then by saying, okay, well, th we hear this is what needs to change. Now you fix the problem is, is for me is what tokenism is because it's not my job um, to do that. But um, so really just bringing p those people to the table like POCs, listening to it and then but not also just listening to those people at the table, but 
um, other people in the community, because even those people at the table have different stories and experiences from the actual community. Um, and taking all of that in and figuring out with the help of the POCs and other POCs of the community, how they can make it better and not just expecting them to solve it themselves. Because um, in my view, like racism was not built by POCs and black people. So we can't dismantle it by ourselves. It is something that was, um, that it was built by uh, whites and that needs to be dismantled by whites. But at the same time, without the views of POCs, you really can't um, do much change because then you're doing it on what you think would be better for that community when that's not what they actually need. That voice, that authentic place for them to share their voice is really important because Jim's perspective enriches our conversation. Mm -hmm. Brianna's perspective enriches the conversation. And so I think, you know, if we don't, nobody wants to be invited to come and do something be, because they, they tick a box. Nobody wants that. So if, if you're going to be an inclusive uh, space or place, you need to go all the way with that. Then you need to not just do the easy stuff, uh, you need to look at your policies about hiring, your culture. You need to look at um, the ways that you build welcome into what you do or don't build welcome into what you do. Um, you know, our oldest son has, has definitely been one of those um, white kids who had had the opportunity to have some um, roommates on campus at CLC that played for gym. And he was the kid who had to go in to get the table. He was the kid who had to, because he understood it. He understood what they experienced um, and didn't question it. So I think, you know, you just, we as white people need to remember that our rules don't apply to other people. And that especially for people of color, often they don't experience the world the way we do. So that genuine willingness to say to them, um, Brianna, tell me, here's a code or here's a way that you can tell me if you're feeling uncomfortable and I'll help with that. Or tell me if afterwards, if there's something I could have done better. Um, that's when we really show up for them and turn it from them having a token voice into having an authentic place where they can help lead. Yeah. I have another question that just came across um, and this is from the Brainerd area. What do you believe is a good first step for communities that don't have a lot of diversity right now and perhaps don't see it as a major issue? We're in the process of planning a diversity and inclusion event for businesses in the Brainerd Lakes area um, and they're just looking for um, any advice. Well, I think I'm going to go back to what um, they're saying that you need, to, you need to invite people, you need to find people. Um, Right now, I'm, I'm with a group and we're trying to put a forum together to speak about race. And they want people of color on this forum. And we must have sat there for <laughs> a long time to figure out who in the leadership role or who is in the business role that owns a business, et cetera, et cetera, as a person of color. And in the Brainerd Lakes area, we only found maybe, maybe two, three people that are, are couple more doctors and one was dentist, but they only live here three days out of the week. <laughs> uh, you, 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 there's nothing here for them. So, so where are they getting their information? Where are they seeing their, their the faces of people of color, just a comfort? Um, that, that's a great question. And, and I wish I had the, all the right answers for it, but, but um, <clears throat> I think people just need to be a little more inviting and, and open arms to, to invite people in, uh, especially of color. Uh, and I think a lot of people do it and don't realize that they're doing it because that's the way it's been all their life or the way the community's always been. Um, just, just to have that opportunity for, for others to step in, um, that welcome them in and, and, and willing to let them talk or let them just be involved. Um, you know, at our college, we try to do a lot of things, diversity. And one of the big things are marketing uh, 
uh, Ken Doles, our marketing director, has done a great job with is just have a picture or two of people of color, uh, so that you you're, you're saying that they're welcome here, or that or we're or we're willing to give them opportunity. Uh, so our community here in, in Brainerd, I think that's one of the big things they need. They need to search search hard uh, uh, and, and to find out what is around here and who is around, so that they can take steps forward to, to make this all work out or to, to say that they're working on it. Um, but right now, you know, I, I'm also working on it myself and we're hoping to try and figure out this school, my program. We're always trying to grow. We're always trying to get better. And it, it's a tough time right now. And I understand that. Um, but it's also a great time to um, do things and, and get things done because right now everybody's listening. Everybody wants to help. So, um, I'm here and I'm, I'm hoping I can help, so. Thank you, Jim. Um, one of the things that um, we look forward to is different resources. So do have, do, are any of you familiar with resources that help people to educate themselves? Any recommendations? I think the biggest resource, honestly, is conversation. Um, cause it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter if you read, um, a book or see a movie because that's one person's view and that's one person's experience and you can't base it off of that just one person. Um, so like just that conversation within itself is the biggest resource you can have because, um, they might have a resource that is not common, um, that you can follow. There might, they might be starting one, they might be wanting to help and start one um, that other people may not have said um, or have not have made yet. Um, but I don't think a personal like resource itself is the actual thing people should look for. Um, especially as I look around, a lot of the resources aren't that are currently in place are not really reaching what needs to be done. Um, so the conversations you have with POCs and um, Blacks and um, all other minorities is the best resource you can have because it gives you pers perspective on not only what your thinking is, um, but perspective on how so many, you can talk to like five different black people who were even raised in the same family and you, can, you will get different results, you will get different experiences. You know, I think sometimes we we rush to have large conversations, right, about this, and let's just throw all the ugly on the table and unpack it, right? But in reality, the way that you make lasting and meaningful change is in a one-to-one -one experience. So when I get to know Jim, or I get to know Brianna as a person, and she begins to trust me, or he begins to trust me, now we can start to make actual meaningful changes. So reading, and um, I'm a big fan of reading. I love to read. Brianna knows that. Um, but, you know, watching the documentary 13 on Netflix, um, starting to educate yourself as, especially as white people, about the darker side of our history, the sides that we don't always hear about, or we'd rather not um, always confront. I, th I think sometimes it's not about how many people can we convene to have a conversation. It's how much reflection time am I spending with this person who looks at me in the mirror? Because when I can change, then I become a tool to help other people change and to use my voice uh, to, to make things better. So until you have relationships built with people of color that are trusting, um, it, they're going to be reluctant to come to large group conversations. They're going to be re reluctant to offer their feedback or to offer their insights um, because there's a lot of years of history where that hasn't been valued. So I do think that's something we all need to be mindful of. Jim, any last comments? Any last comments, Jim? Um. Not a whole lot. I just, like I said, I thank you for having me on, on here. And again, uh, there's a lot of hope out there, I believe, uh, for everybody, for us to continue to grow, but to us to um, come together 
Uh, again, this is, I believe, in my heart, this is a great country. Um, and I thank this country for having me here. Uh, I'm, I'm very blessed to have it. Um, <clears throat> and I hope that, you know, we can continue to grow, but uh, our my program continues to grow here. And that uh, we, and just not just me, but this community, I believe uh, the community makes a difference. And these kids will grow uh, if we if we work together and, and help them grow, uh, because that's that's what this is a, what it's about, and uh, and I believe this is what this is about. So uh, I truly believe that things will get better, uh, but it will be difficult. And um, like I said, it's, uh, it's 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 great that we're having this conversation. Thanks. Thank you. We've had some wonderful um, appreciative comments on the chat for, for all three of you for agreeing to share and uh, giving us a different lens to look through. I'm going to turn it over to Steve to wind us up, though, because we're out of time. Wow. Um, the comments and uh, the chats are um, basically saying powerful, um, great wisdom. And I think that really sums it up. Um, Jim. Um, Brianna, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing today. Um, this was a very powerful session, um, very informative, and in our listening, very important. Um, we are going to be back next week with a focus on St. Cloud and Alexandria with our Community Connections webinar, again, next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Um, if you want to learn more um, and access this uh, recording and or previous recordings of these webinars they are available at our website, which is on the screen, communitygiving.org backslash COVID-19. We also have been collecting ideas and resources for all of us to continue to learn. And that's at ideacenter.communitygiving.org. And as several of our panelists talked about today, it is about educating ourselves and, and continuing to listen and movies or books. And there's a number of resources there. So please visit the Idea Center. And as always, we appreciate your feedback and input. You can email us directly at info at communitygiving.org. We welcome your feedback and comments. And um, we just really wanna thank you for, uh, especially our speakers today for being vulnerable, um, sharing your stories, important, uh, important stories that we need to hear. And uh, we will be back next week. Um, and then the following week, two weeks from today, we're gonna have a session talking about how to have community conversations taking it to the next level beyond listening and actually having those conversations. So please join us for the next two weeks. Thank you so much for joining us and um, be safe and be well. <laughs>